we are continuing in the note packet that we were working out of Friday. Uh, we looked at section 6.1. We looked at uh, energy going into a system and out of the system, system and surroundings, the nature of energy as a whole. Talked a little about temperature versus heat and things like that. But uh, today we're going to get into enthalpy and calorimetry and see how that works. I gave you the assignment uh, that goes with the 10th edition of the textbook. So if you glance at that, um, based on what we did on Friday, there's only like two questions, I think, in the exercises that you could even do relates to that work. So there wasn't a whole lot of homework that you could have done had you gotten this a day earlier. But uh, definitely you'll be able to get a start on that after what we do in class today. Um, All right, so let's take a look. The quantity of heat transferred to or from an object depends on three things. Number one, the quantity of material. Number two, size of the temperature change. And number three, the identity of the substance. is gaining or losing heat. We need to know how much of the material we have. We usually do that in mass. We need to know the magnitude of the temperature change. And we need to know the identity of the substance because different substances gain and lose heat. Um, proportions. There is a concept that ties all those together and that is called the specific heat capacity. Abbreviated by the uh, letter C, it relates all three of those parameters to each other. Uh, specific heat capacity is something that we haven't looked at before, and uh, it is an, an intensive property of matter, so it is um, unique to that substance, um, can be used to identify that substance. The specific heat capacity is a quantitative, quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one Kelvin. Or you could also say the specific heat capacity is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius, since uh, one Kelvin and one Celsius is the same increment on a thermometer. So we kind of use them both, Celsius and Kelvin. Specific heat capacity has units of joules per gram per Kelvin, but since one Kelvin is equal to one degree Celsius, un units are often expressed as joules per gram degree Celsius. The greater the specific heat of a sample and the larger the mass of the sample, the more thermal energy a substance can store. So let's look at a little bit at the equation that works with specific heat weight uh, capacity. The quantity of heat gained or lost when a given mass of a substance is warm or cooled is calculated using the following equation. This is kind of our go-to equation for most of what we're doing today. Relatively simple to work with. Um, Q represents our heat flow. We looked at that last week. Specific heat capacity, the mass of the sample and the change in temperature of the sample. So if we fill in a few things with the units and such. Call this the heat transfer. 
that can go into or out of a, uh, an object. Um, the transfer that's going to be in joules. A specific heat. It's going to be in joules, grams, and degrees Celsius or Kelvin. This will be the mass of the substance. And that, of course, will be in grams. And then change in temperature, delta T. Um, Kelvin or degrees Celsius works for that. I mean, technically, I could have done this too. I guess both work with that. The capital Greek letter delta is a symbol that we use for change in. So the change in temperature, delta T, is always calculated as the final minus the initial temperature. And that's going to be really important that we uh, pay attention to that because that's going to determine if heat is entering something or leaving something. If it's something's being heated or cooled, we want to get the order of those right. Um, because we know in thermodynamics, uh, the sign, positive or negative sign, which would be flip-flopped if you turn them around, is pretty important in determining the direction of the heat transfer. So we'll pay attention to that as we look at examples. Start out with a pretty simple couple of problems. Example number one says copper has a specific heat capacity of 0.385 joules grams Kelvin. We want to calculate the change in heat content when 10 grams of copper undergoes a temperature change from 298 and it's heated up to 598 Kelvin. So sometimes when we abbreviate the heat flow, we can talk about the object that we're heating or cooling. So I'm going to do the heat flow of the copper. Just a little CU under it. We've got 0.385 joules, grams, and Kelvin. And the mass of the copper is 10 grams, no problem. And the temperature change, this is where you got to be careful, the final temperature is 598. The initial temperature was 298 Kelvin. So we want to get final minus initial. If we enter that in properly, we should get a positive value of 1160 joules. And that makes sense because we had a piece of copper, we raised the temperature by 200, <coughs> 300 Kelvin. In order to raise the temperature by 300 Kelvin, we have to put heat energy into it. This is also a little uh, reminder, good reminder perhaps, that uh, temperature and heat are not the same thing. You know, the temperature went up by two, 300 Kelvin or 300 Celsius, but the heat change was something different. They're related, but they're not one and the same. So the value of Q in this scenario, again, Q is equal to a positive 1160 joules of energy was a change in copper endothermic or exothermic when it's a positive value for Q it was endothermic copper was absorbing that heat energy Next, we're uh, finding the heat change that takes place when 410 grams of ethanol 
is raised in temperature from minus 5 to 41 degrees Celsius. We'll talk about this table a little bit next, but let's take a look at this one. So same equation, Cm delta T. Um, figuring out what the change is in the ethanol. We don't have the specific heat capacity of ethanol here, but we do have it on the table down below. Sometimes you have to refer to a table. Your textbook occasionally refers you to Appendix 4. They like to use Appendix 4 a lot for information. And uh, you're probably going to want to figure out how you can find that in your digital textbook. It's on page A4, but I don't, A4 through A, A4A through A4D or something like that, but you'll have to occasionally reference Appendix 4. Um, 2.43 joules, grams, I'll leave it in Celsius here. Mass of 410 grams. And final temperature is 41. Initial temperature is a negative 5 degrees Celsius. I think this is one of the reasons why the textbook always emphasizes Kelvin, is so that you don't run into uh, negative temperatures and encounter a double negative like that. Otherwise, there's really no reason to force Kelvin versus Celsius. And uh, solving for that, Thousand would be absorbed, and again, it makes sense. The temperature is going up from minus five to forty-one. How is the temperature of something going to go up? You got to put heat energy into it. It's got to be an endothermic process for that to warm up. Let's uh, point out a few things on this table for a moment. <clears throat> you get really quite a wide diversity of specific heat capacities for a substance. And uh, <clears throat> one of the highest of all is water, actually. I mean, it's not the highest of all, but it's a very high specific heat compared to most of your normal things. Um, specific heat also is something that changes with states. So we've got to watch out for that when we look at some stuff later on. Um, but some things are quick to heat up and quick to cool down. Other things are slow to heat up and slow to cool down. Water requires a lot of energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It requires that it absorbs 4.184 joules of energy to raise the temperature of water by that much. Whereas if you look at something like copper, it only requires a small amount of energy, like more than 10 times less energy to raise the temperature of that one gram by one degree Celsius. So some things are easier to heat and cool, things with lower specific heats. Some things are more difficult to heat or cool. Those would be something with larger heat capacities. And we'll talk more about the ramifications of heat capacity down the road. I think there was a problem underneath that. If it's at the top of this page. No. Am I missing a problem? No, that was our Oh, I see where I am. Trying to skip ahead myself. Uh, find the mass of bromine. We're going to change up the variables a little bit here. The mass of bromine present. If 4,000 joules of energy was released when the temperature dropped from 98 to 74. So same, uh, same equation. But now we're just solving for the mass. Now there's an important uh, way this is phrased that we got to watch out for. When we talk about the energy being released, they often do this. They'll say the energy was absorbed, they say the energy was released, um, but they don't necessarily give you the correct sign then on the energy. If 4,000 joules was being released, that means it's a negative 4,000 joules of energy. 
sometimes they give you the sign in words instead of giving it with the, the negative sign in front. Watch out for that. Or they'll say 4,000 joules was given off or some similar phraseology that would indicate the sign. Um, we're doing bromine. And for this one, we're still using that table. We've got bromine over here now, 0.474. Trying to find out the mass and the final temperature was 74 and it began at 98 degrees Celsius. There's some easy ways to tell if you've got the signs screwed up somewhere along the way, like maybe you forgot the negative sign in front of the 4000 or maybe you accidentally flipped the temperatures. Uh, there's an easy way to figure that out because when you solve for your mass value, if you get a negative value, you know you screwed up because mass always has to be a positive value. So uh, we combine some things and move some things and we get a mass in this case of 351.6. That's not with sig figs because I gave up on sig figs in this problem a long time ago. Technically this problem can only have one sig fig based on the way it's presented with 4,000 joules. That seems just pointless then. So I skipped sick fix in that one. Take a look at this one. We've got a temperature that we're solving for here. We've got some copper and we're going to heat it up. This time the And we want to figure out what temperature it began at. So I have a positive 3,500 joules. I know it's copper, 0.385 joules gram degree Celsius. 150 grams of the copper, no problem. Temperature final. 192, it absorbs heat, gets up to 192. I want to know what the TI is, the temperature initial. So uh, it might make sense to move the specific heat and the mass over to the other side and simplify this a little bit. And then subtract and add to uh, isolate the variable. And I still didn't use sig figs here either because I didn't feel like it. Two for two. It's no care Tuesday. I'll do sig figs on my next one. But um, as a general idea. Started out cooler, ended up warmer. <laughs> Seems like a reasonable number. It's a modest amount of energy. Um, not that big of a sample. Went up by about 60 degrees. nothing special about number four, but number five, unless I go through number four. Here we got um, determining the quantity of heat, Q, that must be added to raise the temperature of a coffee cup that is 250 milliliters of coffee from 20.5 to 95.6. We assume that the water and coffee have the same density of one gram per one milliliter and the same specific heat capacity. So basically they're saying, treat the coffee as if it's water, which is mostly what it is. And a little mocha creamer. Um, let's see what we got, we're gonna get Q. 
specific heat capacity of water, 4.184. That's one that you're going to just see so frequently, you're going to have it memorized in a day or two. Um, water is used a lot as a reference point. So 4.184 joule gram Celsius. 250 milliliters of coffee at a density of one gram per one milliliter would be 250 grams of coffee. And temperatures kicking up to 95.6, starting at 20.5. So maybe 78,555 joules, positive value, but let's do sig figs this time. Four sig figs, two sig figs, and we subtract, you can get three sig figs over there. Let's go with the two sig figs. I like number five better. More to talk about here. In an experiment, it was determined that 59.8 joules was required to change the temperature of 25 grams of ethylene glycol, a compound used as antifreeze in automobile engines, by one Kelvin. Calculate the specific heat capacity of ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is kind of a neat compound. It's, it's, um, it's like I said, it's used in radiator fluid and it's got a really neat color to it. It's like a kind of thing like Mountain Dew, but almost a little bit more fluorescent looking in its, its coloration. And it's kind of a, and it, the thing about it, it looks like Mountain Dew and it's sweet tasting as well. Poisonous. See, when it comes to murdering people, men usually do it with violence. You know, guns, knives, their hands, whatever. They, that's the way they, you know, testosterone, men are abhorrent people. But women, they're not prone to violence. They like to poison. Women are the poisoners. In fact, there's 5,000 cases of ethylene glycol poisoning a year because it mimics drunkenness. There's a certain euphoria and drunkenness that comes with it as it kills you. So you start mixing it with, you know, your, your, your beverages and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe it kind of throws them in your Mountain Dew. Next thing you know, you know, a little euphoria. Maybe associate that with some alcohol or something like that. And next thing you know, you're on your way to uh, heart failure, renal failure, and uh, I don't know, something with the lungs, I think, too. But uh, yeah, apparently 5,000 women a year decide to, not all women, but it does say, I was looking at the internet, 5,000 cases a year, mostly men. It's so a women. You murderous women. It's easier to kill us just by breaking our hearts. You don't have to murder us, okay? Where was I with this? Oh yeah, specific heat capacity. So you take the, oh, and the other thing about it is you got a leaky radiator and you know you have a leaky radiator because you got this like glowing green stuff on your, on your driveway. Don't lick it. But clean it up because uh, dogs will go and they'll be like sniff, 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 and they'll give it a little lick, and it's like, oh, that's sweet, and they'll start licking it up, and then it goes well. Um, in an experiment, we got this going on. We want to calculate the specific heat capacity this time. We want to calculate C. So. We know this many joules were involved, uh, 50.8 joules. 
was required. It doesn't specify if it's like endothermic or exothermic very well, so that's kind of sloppy. Uh, we want to calculate C. We got the mass of the sample was 25 degrees, 25 grams, I mean, and uh, temperature changed by one Kelvin, also kind of vague. Did it go up by one Kelvin or down by one Kelvin? It went one Kelvin. So I got two things that are a little bit vague in terms of their signs, but I do know one thing about this. Specific heat capacities are always a positive value. So I can't have an, I can't make this negative or that negative and still get a value for C unless they were both negative, but it'd still be the same value for C. In this case, C is going to be nine grams and Kelvin. So compared to some other things on that list from the previous page, um, it's a little bit, um, a little bit on the higher side. I mean, it can absorb quite a bit of energy um, to raise the temperature to one gram by one Kelvin, but it's much less than water. And we're supposed to compare it to water here for the next part. If the heat capacity of ethylene glycol in 3.9 versus water, which is 0.184, that makes 1.75 times greater or water. And that's part of the reason why they use it in a radiator. Um, when it comes to ethylene glycol versus water, the one that's going to heat up quicker is going to be the one with the smaller specific heat capacity. To raise the temperature of this by one Kelvin, one gram of this by one Kelvin, it takes less energy. So if you're applying a constant heat source, this will heat up at a faster rate than the water. It also goes down faster. by a factor of 1.75 than water. And that's why they put it in the radiator for your car. Um, let's talk a little bit about like how a car engine cools itself. So all cars have a radiator. Not anymore. Just thought about that as I said that. Unless you drive an electric car, no radiator needed in, in the electric cars, I don't think. Can't think of anything why they would have one. All gas engines have a radiator in them. And in the engine block itself, something that you don't normally think about because we're not like mechanics and engineers here, but um, you got an explosion going constantly, you know, lots of explosions going in your in your in your pistons, spark plug here, oxygen and fuel mixing here, and then you got your piston that's gonna, you know, get everything moving. But constant explosions generates lots of heat and the metal surrounding that can get really, really hot. So built into the engine block itself, you've got spaces. And in those spaces, they have fluids flowing through them that are pulling the heat away from the engine block, taking it to the radar, radiator where it's gonna cool down and then uh, pumping that cooler radiator fluid back in here. So it's a whole cooling cycle taking place. Um, leaving the engine hot, passes through the radiator, comes out the other end of the radiator much cooler, goes back into the engine block, weaves its way around, gets heated up and comes back and completes the cycle again. The radiator itself has these metal fins on it and the fluid goes back and forth like this through the radiator. So it takes a while to get to the other end. 
So as you're driving down the road and you're blowing air over those, those metal fan blades, and by the way, the metal is uh, quick at dissipating heat as well, comes in hot here, comes out much cooler here, and the cycle continues. So, so the, one of the main reasons that they use ethylene glycol instead of just water in the radiator is because it's quicker to absorb that energy. You know, assuming there's a constant heat source coming from the engine, it's quicker to take in that energy. But then as it goes to the radiator, it's also quicker to dissipate that energy. If you just had water in there, the water would get hotter and hotter and hotter, go past the boiling point of the water, could potentially vaporize in there as well, and um, is not releasing the heat fast enough so you'd be pumping more hot water in there. Keep, the engine would run hotter if there was just water circulating through the system. The engine runs cooler because ethylene glycol dissipates the heat faster. It also does another thing that's uh, just kind of a benefit of that particular chemical. Ethylene glycol, your radiator fluid's like 50% water and 50% ethylene glycol. And uh, the ethylene glycol raises the boiling point of the water solution, the solution as a whole, by like 40 degrees Celsius. So instead of boiling at 100 degrees Celsius and vaporizing, goes up to like 140 degrees uh, Celsius without vaporizing, so it keeps it in a liquid state. And even more importantly for us, in the summer, it decreases the freezing point of water, which if you think about it, in January when it's minus 20 outside, you don't want all the water in your engine block and your radiator to freeze because when water freezes, it expands and you burst your radiator and you literally like burst your engine block if you have frozen water in your engine. But ethylene glycol lowers the freezing point to like minus 30 or something like that. So you don't freeze up your engine block, which is also extremely important for us. So a lot of benefits to using that chemical. But don't poison anybody with it. I'm not promoting that. Human excellence people, you don't do that kind of thing. If your Mountain Dew tastes a little funny, I'm just saying. Reevaluate your relationships. take a look at uh, how we use that equation in calorimetry. Now, would you agree up to this point, the math has been pretty easy? Like if we just did a whole bunch of that, you'd be like, bring it, got that. Let's lock this down, get some easy points. But for whatever reason, when we take that equation and we put it in with a calorimeter, um, people start getting a little bit turned around on that. So let's see what's going on with calorimetry. The heat transferred in a chemical or physical process is measured by an experimental technique called calorimetry. A device called a calorimetry measures changes in heat by absorbing heat from a reaction or by supplying heat to a reaction. So we're going to basically focus on how a calorimeter works. The thing about measuring heat is you can't measure it directly. You can't just stick a thermometer into something and get the heat. Remember, a thermometer just tells you the temperature. It doesn't tell you the heat. So to get the heat information, we need a device called a calorimeter. And there's different types of calorimeters. We're going to basically look at two different styles. And today, we're just going to be looking at this one. Constant pressure calorimetry is uh, what we're going to do. Heat changes at constant pressure are often measured in general chemistry using a coffee cup calorimeter. This inexpensive device consists of two nested styrofoam coffee cups with a loose fitting lid and a thermometer. And it looks something like this. Not one, but two 
styrofoam cups. Twice the insulation. Styrofoam is actually a really good insulator. I've held glasses of um, liquid nitrogen in styrofoam cups before. And if it's just one styrofoam cup, it gets a little bit cold. But keep in mind, like liquid nitrogen is like, you know, minus 200 or something like that Celsius. It's pretty good, you know. Put two cups in there and you can hold that cup of liquid nitrogen indefinitely. I mean, it's going to be cold to the touch, but it's not going to like give you frostbite or anything. It's really a good insulator. Bad for the environment, good for insulating. Um, so then you take that, you put in some water, and usually you would mass out the water so that you know how much you got there. You put on a, a lid, and then you put in your thermometer. Done. Coffee cup calorimeter. Works pretty well. Um, and then if you're fancy, one of those fancy people, you put in a stirrer too. But, you know, I'm no genius. But I think if you move the thermometer around, you can get the same effect. Just, uh. So that's kind of the design of it. And what we do is we put something into the calorimeter. We get, we, we, if we know the mass of the water and we know the specific heat of the water, we know the temperature changes in the water, we can use what happens to the water to figure out what happens when we put something else in there. So we put an object into that, we measure the changes that occur, and uh, we find out something about the process being examined. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to an example. Let's say we've got a coffee cup calorimeter set up with 260 grams of water. Initially, it's at a temperature of 21.2. You know, you're just sitting there and starting out. 21.2. Next, uh, we're going to put 15 grams of calcium hydroxide and dissolve it into the solution. And this process causes the temperature to rise to 34.6 degrees Celsius. So using the calorimeter, the first thing I'll do is figure out what's going on in the calorimeter. I'll call it the Q of the cal, Q cal. In the calorimeter where I have the water, water is at 4.184. The mass of the water in the calorimeter is 260. Temperature ended at 34.6 degrees Celsius. It started at 21.2, so final minus initial. And when I do that, we get a positive 15400 joules. Makes sense. I put uh, the temperature went up. Well, temperature is going to go up because the temperature of the water is increasing. And uh, it makes sense that it would be a positive value from that point of view. So let's put this to say my H2O Next, we're supposed to calculate the heat from the reacting system. So the stuff we put in the calorimeter was producing the energy that made this go up. So the Q of the reaction is essentially going to be the opposite of what the Q was in the calorimeter. The calorimeter absorbed that energy, then the reaction was releasing that energy, and they're giving me the same magnitude, just opposite signs. So the Q for the reaction in this case, Rxn, is going to be a negative 15,400 joules of energy. I'll call this the energy release by the dissolving process. Calcium 
calcium hydroxide dissolves in water. It's an exothermic reaction. It releases that much. According to the first law of thermodynamics, energy is not created or destroyed. It's just transferred from one thing to the other. So the energy was transferred from here to here. And uh, temperature of the water went up accordingly. The heat flow for a reaction system will be equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the calorimeter and its contents. Again, the calorimeter and its contents are just the tool that we're using to figure out what the reaction is doing. So Q of the calorimeter is opposite to the Q of the reaction. I did the signs differently here, but it's the same thing. They have to be opposite signs, but equal magnitude. Um, the other way of stating it is that the energy of the calorimeter plus the energy of the reaction has to add up to zero. But again, they'd be the same magnitude, but opposite signs to add up to zero. This is basically just saying that the uh, energy in the universe is constant. Total energy in the universe is constant. But I like to work off this one more. We took those um, equations. This is also a common way to express that. What's going on in the calorimeter on the left? And then what's going on in the reaction on the right, depending on how much information we need to solve for. And the thing to watch out for is that you got that negative sign on that side of the equation. Again, this is kind of my preferred way to do it. I will make a little note though that the textbook likes to show on the answer keys. They like to kind of solve it this way and I always solve it this way. So it's pretty easy to see how they're connected, but it always looks a little bit different on the answer key, I guess. Let's take a look at this coffee cup calorimeter one where there's a little bit more to solve. <clears throat> We've got a coffee cup calorimeter. It's filled with 100 milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius. A solid metal cube is heated to 59 degrees Celsius and immediately placed into the calorimeter. After several minutes, the temperature of the calorimeter and the cube reach a common temperature of 29 degrees Celsius. We call that thermal equilibrium because the temperature of everything is the same. No heat is being transferred at that point. And we want to determine the mass of the cube. So let's do this. I'm going to use this equation for solving that problem. I'm going to do the water on one side and the copper on the other side. So 100 milliliters of water, 4. Um, it's 100 milliliters. I'm going to assume that the density of water is one gram per one milliliter, like it was in the previous problem or a couple problems ago. I'm going to say that's 100 grams of water. And uh, What am I doing? Uh, final minus the initial temperature. So the temperature of the water and the metal ends at 29. And it began for the water at 25. So that's the Q for one side of the reaction. That's the Q of the calorimeter on one side of the reaction. Then that's equal to, don't forget the negative sign, the specific heat of the copper, degrees Celsius. We're solving for the mass of the copper. Temperature of the copper ends at 29 degrees Celsius, but it so temperature initial was 59 degrees Celsius. So with all that in there, it's just a matter of multiplying, dividing, subtracting. Mass comes out to be 146 grams of copper.
is kind of neat that you can uh, take the volume of the water, get the mass of the water by density, do all the stuff, never use the uh, scales once and still find out the mass of the sample of copper. Worst way ever to find the mass of copper though, because these coffee cup calorimeters do not give the best results. Hard to believe, I know. You're looking at this and saying, that's high tech science right there. Quality of results, eh, not so good. In fact, last year we skipped the calorimetry lab because of COVID and uh, losing time, a lot of time along the way. Um, we'll bring it back. Uh, I'm trying to decide what day of the week we're gonna do the calorimetry lab. But uh, we'll get a few results that are reasonable, but we'll get a lot of results that are just kind of cool. Oh, huh? You're not great on your results for this lab, not like the last lab. There's not going to be a dartboard, but uh, that's good because, like, you'd be missing the board entirely. But we'll do it anyway, just get the experience and play around with the calculations and such. So that was uh, like a lump of metal plopped in there. With the next one, we're going to have something that reacts in the calorimeter, and that is a little bit different of a scenario. Here, we're going to do one gram of ammonium nitrate placed in 50 grams of water in a calorimeter. We got the reaction that takes place. It's a dissolving process. That's basically all that's happening there. And when that happens, the water temperature drops from 25 down to 23.4. No heat is lost through the walls of the calorimeter. And we want to figure out what's going on in that dissolving process and calorimeter. This reaction, this ammonium nitrate dissolving reaction, is the exact same reaction that we did Friday with the instant cold pack that I passed around the room. Um, sodium nitrate, ammonium nitrate and uh, water mixed together and they make the temperature of the water go down, which is why it's a cold pack. So a chemical reaction, or in this case, just the dissolving taking place. It's really just dissolving, a physical change. Q for the water in the calorimeter. So I'm going to call it the, I don't know, Q the water. Oh, Q the cal. Q the water, Q the cal. It's all the same in this case. Uh, we know it's 4.184 specific heat of water. That number comes up a lot. We're still in Celsius, so I'll leave it at that. Um, the mass of the water, 50 grams. Temperature final, 23.4, zero. Celsius minus 25. The Q of the calorimeter is going to be negative 341 joules, which means in that case. Water now is a uh, Water in the calorimeter is like providing energy to the reaction, so the reaction can take place. We know that uh, dissolving from the instant cold pack, we know that the ammonium nitrate makes it go colder. So the ammonium nitrate dissolving is sucking in energy, and where is it getting the energy from? It's getting it from the water. Yeah.
What are you getting? Uh, 335. 335? Oh. <laughs> I, I put a number up there wrong. And this is a mistake that I made, uh, unknowingly made, way back uh, when I first started teaching this. Now, it would make sense, right? Specific heat of water, mass of water, change of temperature of the water, to leave it like that, right? That, that, that seems totally logical. But there's this one little thing that I forgot to do, because I was talking and not thinking, and it's right here. When you do the mass, you have to do the mass of the water and the solute. So it's kind of funny to me because uh, like my first couple of years of teaching AP chemistry, I never did that. I would put the 50 in there and my answers would be close, but not right. Just thinking what's going on here. I just never really gave it that much thought. And then I kind of, I think by my third year, I had figured out what was going on. It still doesn't make sense to me to, to this day. If this is a specific heat of water, why that one gram of something that's not water would be included in there. I think it's more um, an adjustment because it's going to be closer in value to the right answer, but I, I think there's something that's more sophisticated that's oversimplified in the whole equation. But this is definitely something to watch out for. Because as you saw, I just missed it. And uh, I'm actually super glad you caught that. Otherwise, it'd been really embarrassing when I was doing this later on. And, Never had told you totally that. So watch out for that. If you're dissolving something into a solution in a coffee cup calorimeter, you have to add the mass of the reactant that's dissolving to the water mass. You wouldn't do this if it was just a chunk of metal. Like if I plopped in a chunk of copper metal, copper's not reacting with the water. In, the, in that case, it's like two separate entities. But when it's something that dissolves into the water, then you have to include it with the water. So if the water is giving heat to it, then the Q of the reaction, you could call it the Q of the reaction, you could call it the Q of the dissolving process. That is going to be the same number but the opposite sign. And this is going to be the energy absorbed in the dissolving process. So ammonium nitrate makes the water cooler by sucking energy away from it. The part of the reaction that's being endothermic is the dissolving NH4 and O3. So that's got the positive 341. When we do our lab later this week, it's a two-part lab. There's two different procedures. One procedure is heating up a piece of metal and then plopping in some water and figuring out the specific heat of the metal. The other part is taking a certain mass of a solute, uh, ionic compound, 
dissolving it into the calorimeter, figuring out the temperature change, and figuring out how much heat that sample um, absorbed or released. So uh, you'll do this part, one of those things in your lab there. Number two here is actually very much like your lab as well. In fact, um, calculation-wise, it's the same kind of thing that you do in the lab. But this time, it's not going to dissolve. It's just going to be a chunk of aluminum metal dropped into the water. So no dissolving taking place. Suppose we got 100 grams of water at 22.4 in a calorimeter. Let's get the calorimeter side going here. We got water in a calorimeter, 4.184. At the mass of water, 100 grams. And uh, initially, it's at 22.4. A hot piece of aluminum is plopped in there, and the temperature of water goes up to 32.9. So 32.9 is the final, and 22.4 is the initial. Final minus initial always. We want to figure out, make sure you get the negative sign here, the specific heat of aluminum, I'll call it C of Al, when the mass of the aluminum is 75.25 grams, the final temperature is 32.9, and the initial was 99.33. When we do this in the lab, um, to heat up our metal, a chunk of metal, how do you know the, the heat of a chunk of metal? Like, okay, here's a chunk of aluminum, and I want to find out the initial temperature of it. I can't just stick a thermometer in there or hold it against the surface and get a good temperature reading. So what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, heating up our metal sample in a hot water bath in like a test tube, and then suspending that in a hot water bath for like 10 minutes, maybe 15, I don't remember. Um, and sure enough, if this piece of metal is in a hot, boiling hot water bath for 10 minutes, it's going to eventually come to the same temperature as the hot water bath. So I can measure the temperature of the hot water bath, get the temperature of the metal that way, and then plunk it into the uh, calorimeter and see what happens. Spill. Um, back to this. So I want to solve for specific heat. I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. 4393 on this side. Negative C of L. And this is negative 4997. And divide and get that by itself. 0.879 joule gram. Celsius. Specific heats always have to be a positive value. So if you came up with a negative value, probably losing track of this sign here, or maybe accidentally flipping your temperature differences around. And then what we do in the lab is we look at our specific heat that we get. And we look at a possible list of possible uh, elements and try to find out what the match would be. Kind of like we did with density, but using a calorimeter instead. Only your densities are really spot on, and this is probably going to be way off. Just saying. Maybe it won't be. Maybe you're that good. Know what's going on, you're gonna have to carry his ass again. Um, and he's gonna be watching it too. Sorry, Pratik. We weren't talking about you, I was talking about a different Pratik. 
Number three. Uh, this one's kind of like the sloppiest scenario. We got a piece of iron, kind of the same as above. A piece of iron is going into water, temperature, temperature, water, mass. We're trying to find out the final temperature of the system, though. What's the final temperature of the water and the piece of metal when they're put together? The only thing we don't know is temperature final. 1.184 on the calorimeter side. Uh, mass of the water, 244. Temperature final is what we're solving for. But the water, while it was sitting there, before this all began, it was at 18.8 degrees. Specific heat of the iron, 0.449. Mass of the iron is known. Final temperature is what we're solving for. Initial temperature of the iron, 78.8 degrees. So it's just messy. Just messy. You know, that's not complex algebra, but let me simplify it a little bit for you so we can. Try yourself and see where any disagreements may pop up. So if I can combine some like terms and simplify it a little bit, distribute, do some things like that, keeping track of my signs, which is always the hardest, clumsiest part. I can simplify it to Can't tell if that's a decimal point there or not. Maybe there's a decimal point there, maybe there's not. Smudged it. You would know real quick when you figure out the temperature, you're off by a factor of a thousand or something like that. It would probably be a big deal. RJ, am I good? Is it a decimal point? Make that more pronounced. Um, here's a little thing. When you do a problem like this, where there's more opportunities to make errors with your signs and you know calculation mistakes or whatever, just keep this in mind. You had some water at 18.8. You had a hot piece of metal of 78.8. It's a pretty safe bet that the final temperature is going to be somewhere between those two numbers. Right? I mean, that's like a given. So if it's not, then you know you got a calculation mistake. And I've had a lot of people on tests and stuff that I've graded that it's like it's not even realistic or possible to be higher than or lower than those initial <coughs> temperatures of the water and the metal. Um, and then another thing to consider is that when we're looking at iron versus water, specific heat wise, um, iron specific heat is about 10 times less than water. So iron is going to change temperatures uh, to a greater extent. A little bit of heat is going to cause a greater amount of uh, change in the temperature of the iron. The same amount of heat is going to cause much less change in temperature of the water. So the water doesn't have as huge of a change, but the iron does. It makes sense that it's closer to water and further away from the iron. So you can do a lot of like, does this make sense? Deduction, deductions as you're processing 
the answer and double checking yourself. That's usually the worst. We usually they do it, but it's just like annoying. It's more annoying than anything else. Um, so that's most of the basic coffee cup calorimeter stuff. Up to this point, even though the section is titled Enthalpy and Calorimetry, calorimetry we haven't really talked about enthalpy and what that is. So I'm gonna introduce it to you today for a bit. And uh, we're just gonna look at maybe the front and back of this last page here. And then we'll stop at that point. We'll take a look at bottom calorimetry ne uh, next time. So enthalpy um, is actually much more commonly used in thermochemical equations and describing energy than Q is. Q has got a kind of a narrow focus and we've kind of run the course on how much we can use Q. We got to introduce enthalpy now. They're like siblings. The heat absorbed or released during a chemical reaction at constant pressure, divided by delta H. H is a symbol for a quantity called enthalpy or heat content. Now, keep in mind Q has been measuring the amount of heat that's transferred from one thing to another. And delta H would be the change in heat content, which would be the same thing. So there's, they're almost the same thing. Uh, most chemical reactions are run in open vessels, so the pressure is constant and equal to the atmospheric pressure. Now this is where we get to save a whole bunch of time because the college board decided in 2019 that they wouldn't, they gave a list of clarification statements in 2019 because there was a lot of confusion on how much depth we had to go into on certain things. And uh, so they went through and they clarified <coughs> this topic in particular. And they said uh, Delta E, which was always a part of the stuff we had to teach, we're not really gonna focus on Delta E. Now we did a little bit of that because we were introducing the system and the surroundings and energy going out and energy going in. And we introduced the idea that work could be done as well done by or done on the system. So we did introduce you to this and just show you how that works, but mostly it was just to get comfortable with the idea. What we didn't look at is how pressure and changes in volume is the type of work that's usually done in chemistry, um, like moving a piston, changing the volume of the container at a constant pressure. And we're not going to because we don't have to anymore. And it just, we don't have to worry about it. So ultimately, what we got to do is skip back down here where we see that the change in enthalpy is going to be the same as the heat flow at a constant pressure. And we don't really have to know why that constant pressure is a big deal, but it's because of the work that's not being done. At constant pressure, where work is um, only allowed as P times V, the change in enthalpy or delta H of the system is equal to the energy flow of heat. In other words, delta H is equal to Q, where the only work allowed is that from changes in volume. Most chemical reactions run in open vessels, so the pressure is constant and equal to the atmospheric pressure. We're also not going to be doing a lot of reactions that would involve work being done, so we can basically keep this pretty simple. Sometimes QP is used to symbolize heat flow at a constant pressure. So heat flow at a constant pressure, thus QP equals delta H is a more accurate way of expressing it. But we do use them in a different context, but they do both represent heat coming into a system or heat coming out of a system. More specifically, Delta H is going to be the enthalpy of the products, the heat content of the products minus the heat content of the reactants. Again, it's that final minus initial thing. You produce your products. That's the final part of your reactant reaction. These are your initial reactants. Final minus initial is how we calculate and get the correct sign for Delta H. That being said, it's no surprise that Q and Delta H are treated similar 
endothermic reactions have a delta H that is positive. And likewise, it would be positive. And exothermic reactions have a negative delta H. And no surprise, Q would be negative. Those are also true that they kind of jive with enthalpy. They're going to be handled differently, and we'll see that more tomorrow. But um, I want to just do the top half of this page and show you graphically where that delta H is coming from. We looked at one of these on Friday. Uh, we got energy over here in kilojoules. Could be joules. It just has to be kilojoules this time. We got the reactions, the products. We got the course of reaction, which is basically just like a time progression. And over the course of time, the reactants would go from here to here in terms of the energy change. And the enthalpy that we're going to be talking about is really this magnitude right here. Have more energy, the products have less energy. How much heat content do the reactants have? How much heat content do the products have? The difference between the two is the delta H. Is this endothermic or exothermic? Exothermic. So delta H would be negative in this case. The products would have a lower enthalpy than the reactants. And this is an exothermic. Nothing to really contradict what we said on Friday, but now we're labeling uh, delta H where that enthalpy is. And if we uh, looked at the opposite scenario, all the other parts are the same. It's just that we're starting up with less energy, ending up with more energy. So the change in enthalpy must be an increase um, that value must be going up positive products have a higher enthalpy or energy in the products after this reaction and let's say that's endothermic Let's just finish. Let's just finish this page. We're never ahead of first block by anything, so let's just get ahead of them for half of the page. Looking ahead a little bit, it's really common to write these energy diagrams like this. Got that little hump in there. Let's say this was an exothermic reaction, like a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions give off energy. You have more energy in the reactants, less energy in the products. That energy is given off as heat and light. But combustion reactions don't just necessarily happen on their own. They usually need to be ignited. You have to put some energy into them. And this energy diagram includes something called activation energy. It's usually abbreviated as EA for energy of activation. And that's the minimum amount of energy required to start a reaction. During this phase, transitional structures develop, old bonds are being broken, new bonds are being formed, making an activated complex. But the activation energy is this little bit of energy here. It's necessary to get, let's say, your combustion reaction started. You gotta light it. You gotta bring in some energy to get it going. You gotta get over the hump, 
Once you get over the hump, the reaction starts to proceed spontaneously from reactants to the products. So that activation energy might include something like heat. Sometimes you got to give it a little energy that way. Sometimes light works. Some reactions are photosensitive, uh, or maybe you have to give it a little electricity. By light, we could use actually refer to any electromagnetic radiation. But heat, light, electromagnetic radiation, or electricity might be required to get that reaction going in the forward direction. But how much energy it can produce is still going to be the difference between the reactants and the products, regardless of what you have to do to get it started. And then the last little thing here, The activation energy is a hindrance in the forward progression of that reaction. It's kind of like a speed bump that you have to get over. And with the presence of a catalyst, you can reduce the uh, activation energy or even eliminate the activation energy, allowing the reaction to take place faster without any interference. In biology, you call those enzymes. Enzymes or catalysts. What they're doing giving you a more direct path between the reactants and the products. You're still going to produce the same amount of energy, but you've reduced the hill that you have to overcome, or maybe even eliminated that hill that you have to overcome to make the reaction go forward. So the dotted line represents the catalyzed reaction. Blue line represents without the catalyst. So catalysts work to uh, reduce energy and make things more efficient that way. So we'll uh, finish up section two tomorrow. We're going to look at some thermochemical equations, bomb calorimeters, and we're going to try to connect make a better connection between Q and delta H because right now they seem like they're the same thing, but how you use them is different and that's uh, an important connection we need to make. And then we'll probably uh, get into section four and three tomorrow as well. I'm trying to decide if I want to do the lab sooner to this calorimetry unit while it's still fresh in your minds because then that would probably be Thursday. Or do I want to do it on Friday because that's going to end the week. Still quite around with the day. Test uh, right now, it's scheduled for like Monday of next week. So basically, the question is, do I want to try to get through all the content first and then do the lab? Or throw the lab in the middle? And, I don't know. So I haven't decided that yet. Definitely get started on the assignment. Um, there's definitely some stuff with heat capacity and calorimetry. The only thing you got to be a little careful with is I don't know how many of those calorimetry problems deal with a bomb calorimeter. If they mention the word bomb anywhere in there, stay away from it for the day. But if, if it's organized like I think it is, it starts out with the coffee cup calorimeter stuff and should end with bomb um, calorimeter stuff. Oh. So some of you are gone tomorrow for PSAT. Um, I don't have the notes photocopy yet, but I will have photocopy sometime during lunch. So if you want to pick them up later today, like after, I would have to get them gone pretty quick here. Um, if you want to pick up maybe toward the end of the day or before school, I'm here at like 7.15. I know you guys got to be there by like 7.30, right? I think so. Pretty early.
but um, swing by later and I should have the note guides and then I will record tomorrow's lesson or tomorrow's lesson and make it available to you on video. Um, we were also going to ask if you mentioned to put calculation setups like did you happen to say that on the work day that we were given? Wasn't on the last one. Yeah, it was. That, it was we right, right on the we corrections. There. Yeah, that's that, no that explains it. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for all the labs, anytime we do an analysis question, it's got to be shown with calculation setup. So that was true in the previous two labs as well. Oh, so calculation setups just for the analysis? Or yeah, in the analysis <laughs> questions, like when you overshoot the um, purity, oh. you know, like when you overshoot the uh, end point of the reaction, and the analyzing how that's going to affect your KHP results. We had like two questions like that at the end. You're supposed to use the uh, calculation setups with the up and down arrows to show how that's going. Was that um, three points off? It would have been two points off, I believe, oh. for that. Okay. So I can't.